Good evening and welcome to everyone. Uh, welcome to our Wednesday evening seminar with Mr. Ambassador Paul Collor. Paul Collor studied philosophy, French and English literature at, and archaeology at the University of Geneva. Later he also studied physics and did epistemological work on modern space and time concepts at the University of Munich. In 1981, he joined the Swiss Federal Department for Foreign Affairs. That was the beginning of his career as diplomat and later ambassador of Switzerland. In this function, he has lived and worked in many different countries, including Sweden, Iraq, France, Uzbekistan, Libya, Slovenia, and Greece. Since 2010, he is a special envoy for human rights related issues with the Directorate of Political Affairs in Bern. And today he will speak about Swiss human rights and peace policy in a changing world. Thank you for being here and talking to us tonight. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Brunner. Uh, uh, thank you all for coming and uh, uh, for this invitation. It's always uh, uh, a great pleasure to speak in front of uh, people that not only know about the scene but uh, also certainly share some concerns of uh, uh, what you are uh, proposing for uh, discussion. Uh, I uh, 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 have prepared a few slides uh, so that you, it might be more easy for you to follow and uh, it might also help for uh, discussions uh, afterwards. I would like to uh, point out that uh, uh, this institution, uh, I'm speaking to you now, uh, this institution of the World Peace Acad Academy in Basel is impressing me very much because it's a young institution. It has been built up in so little of time and I think the presence of you all here shows that it, has, it is working with quite some success and I would congratulate uh, you for that, uh, for all the investment uh, people present here and others have uh, uh, done in this institution. I wish you the very best for uh, the future. Uh, as I uh, it is noted here, I will speak about Swiss human rights and peace policy in a changing world. I uh, uh, will present my personal views, so uh, don't pin me down on official views uh, of Switzerland that might be slightly different. So evidently, when I'm speaking as a special envoy for human rights of the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs, uh, I'm uh, quite well informed on what is going on in this field and uh, my uh, expose might be slightly tainted by human rights issue and not only peace promotion issues, but uh, I think from what what I will say uh, during this uh, coming hour, you will understand that uh, this goes very much together and in fact uh, an integrated approach of such problems uh, is necessary and we think uh, from uh, the Foreign Ministry of Switzerland uh, such an integrated uh, approach is highly uh, necessary and uh, even more though as the conflicts in our world become more and more protracted and complicated. Uh, I would like to start a little bit to speak, uh, or to see uh, in a quick review what are the challenges and the context of our uh, activities. Uh, it is clear that we are living in a very rapidly changing world our uh, fathers and uh, grandmothers 
we are probably uh, not exposed to such changes as we are now. Actually, you could start and live uh, quietly uh, quite some decennies and uh, in fact uh, 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 go out of your life after uh, a good span of life uh, with more or less the same conditions as you have uh, entered this life. This is not the case anymore. The changes in our world become more and more rapid and uh, in fact uh, uh, when we uh, look back at uh, two, three generations uh, the setup was uh, complete, completely different. The nature of conflict was completely different and uh, uh, just as uh, a few words on this, when you think uh, what happened since the fall of the wall in Berlin or now the Arab Spring. Uh, the Arab Spring, for example, where now people were asking for democracy and freedom and maybe a few years ago only uh, people pretended that this world was not uh, prone and not uh, open to dem democracy at all and uh, such uh, ideas wouldn't have any success in this world. So, uh, you see how quickly uh, things can change. And actually, what is also very important in this context is the globalization. It is uh, uh, above all a fact and uh, it certainly implies chances and risks. Uh, I have uh, pointed to some developments in this respect. But I would naturally also make a few remarks on, on, on different elements. Uh, migration, communication and cultural exchange. Uh, I would also include their tourism. Uh, does it really mean that we enter into contact with each other or is it just remaining very much at, uh, at the superficial level? Uh, that's a, a question that I faced yesterday when I was speaking in the framework of an intercultural seminar of the uh, foreign ministry uh, in Matling. And people tell me, yeah, but this common hand is, or these friends, thousands of friends, hundreds of friends on Facebook, what does this mean? This is nothing that really goes into the depths uh, and really. Uh, and challenges our life. It remains, or it has a tendency, maybe, I uh, just put it as a question to remain uh, very superficial. It is clear also that together with this globalization, we have uh, identity reactions, or you might call that identity reactions. We have uh, movements uh, of more nationalistic. Uh, interpretations of the uh, world. We have uh, religious extremism with uh, a very strong uh, pointing out the identity of such or uh, such uh, religions. We even have uh, tendencies, uh, clear tendencies towards uh, uh, racism. Uh, uh, let's say, uh, naturally, uh, very difficult uh, uh, theme as uh, in racism you consider in generally a small group as being worse than all the others and yourself and actually such approaches that we see now increase in our world uh, must be uh, uh, major preoccupations uh, for us uh, today. We have also po more positive uh, 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 developments uh, in fact, we have much less violent conflicts, conflicts in, in our world of today than uh, 20 years ago. In the 90s, we had about 30 civil wars. Now, it's not even 10. Uh, we have uh, a tendency towards more intrastate conflicts. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, nowadays, we have no war between states that is ongoing. So, uh, Few years ago, we still had a few wars uh, in between states. Uh, we have conflicts uh, that are maybe not at the level of civil war, but they are still violent because uh, uh, 
uh, they turn around, around uh, scarce resources, for example, or, or other uh, problems of uh, our globalized world. We have also, I think, uh, uh, and, and maybe to conclude that, uh, you probably know that the World Development Report uh, 2011 of the World Bank, that was, I think, a milestone uh, in analysis of uh, what conflict uh, security and development uh, is about, about. And it shows, uh, because it comes uh, a milestone, why, why I'm saying that? Because it comes from an institution that uh, had generally a very economical approach and now has recognized that, uh, in fact, uh, conflict security development is met as much or even more so the problems of uh, institution building, of living together than just an economical problem. And in this uh, report uh, they uh, uh, state that uh, today still one and a half billion of people are living in conflict-driven uh, areas. That is a huge amount of, uh, of part of our world population. And uh, uh, in, in a sense, uh, the conflict fits also tend to become more protected and attracted and, and more recurring. That is, that some countries seem not to be able to go out of uh, continuous cycles of violence, uh, of repeated cycles of violence. And naturally, this is uh, certainly a big uh, challenge. I will come back to that also, how to address uh, such complicated uh, situations. Otherwise, you can uh, maybe a word to, to the second last uh, point here, legitimacy and universality of human rights uh, put into question. It is a fact that uh, maybe we are living in a world where some uh, rising powers are more in a traditional mindset where you have uh, the, uh, the principle of non-interference that is much stressed and have maybe not yet uh, taken up uh, the uh, full weight of their res responsibility within world affairs. Uh, this is uh, certainly one reason maybe to uh, question the universe, universality of human rights. It also uh, the cultural differences uh, among people that uh, gives uh, rise from time to time to such uh, questions. I must say in my work I'm always astonished how much values in fact you share. Uh, when you address uh, Let's say, let's say Vietnamese or uh, uh, Sen Senegalese or whatever people, I think you have very often uh, quite good basic understanding and it's not really uh, a problem, this universality, because uh, the consciousness is there that we have reached, uh, the, let's say, the core body of human rights and of principles of living together. Uh, in, in together and in exchange in between different uh, uh, countries, in between, in between different approaches, and that uh, this maybe is an exaggerated problem in, uh, after all. What is certainly more important that uh, in many situations you have uh, a lack of political will to implement uh, the rules and uh, rights uh, and uh, in fact very often you have uh, and people, uh, states even are conscious about this problem and ask you to assist them in the implementation either because they are dysfunctional and they cannot implement as they would. Uh, I have uh, many uh, examples of, of that. Uh, or uh, because uh, they, uh, in their specific uh, situation of the moment, don't see uh, this as a priority. It's highly questionable, naturally, 
but uh, uh, it, is, it happens and it is the case. So I think the biggest, uh, most important challenge of our world is certainly to go from declaration uh, to implementation. We have a lot of, uh, a whole body of uh, rules and uh, declarations, uh, uh, international uh, instruments on human rights and so on, but it's very uh, challenging to really implement this uh, instrument. And actually this uh, has many implications, this implementation, because it doesn't uh, just uh, mean that you uh, theoretically or uh, even practically grant existing rights, you also have to uh, obtain uh, true reconciliation, and I will come later uh, in my expose back to that. You have to fight impunity and uh, redress uh, uh, situations from the past. I, here I show you a little bit in uh, somewhat uh, schematic and maybe uh, artificial ways, uh, uh, artificial way, the tendencies uh, from uh, the classical diplomacy of the 19th, uh, 20th century uh, to the uh, more modern approach of today. Uh, I think uh, the tendency in towards a more uh, idealistic approach of international relations is quite obvious. Uh, peace promotion, human rights uh, issues have become very important uh, issues uh, in modern diplomacy uh, and uh, this can uh, uh, be shown, for example, when we speak, speak about uh, um, things like the responsibility to protect uh, the body of rules that was uh, in fact uh, done uh, basically in 2005 under Kofi Annan. Um, there is uh, a general tendency uh, towards uh, a more uh, value-based approach of international uh, relations. It also is clear that in fact hard security uh, that was defined as a last resort in classical di diplomacy has shown an awful tremendous lot of problems. You can follow that uh, nowadays in Afghanistan where uh, the everybody, everybody engaged there would like to go out and it's very difficult to find the exit strategy uh, without uh, leaving a lot of problems behind you. And uh, very often when uh, going into such conflicts uh, with hard power, uh, there was not uh, enough uh, reflection what should be have, uh, happen after that. There was not enough of a strategic approach to such uh, hard security interventions. I would also note uh, that, uh, for example, uh, Hillary Clinton in a noticed uh, intervention years ago or something like that, has uh, uh, spoken about uh, soft power, human security as an essential ingredient in modern diplomacy and I think uh, she uh, uh, was uh, certainly uh, very right in, in with that approach. Uh, I also, a word of caution here, soft power and human security uh, approaches have also imply also problems uh, because uh, from time to time they don't seem to be very efficient and uh, are challenged because of that. We have also other problems like double standards. Uh, why don't you do this uh, in this uh, conflict spot and, uh, rather than in the, in the other and so on? Uh, but uh, generally speaking, uh, I think that uh, diplomacy today certainly has become much, uh, as much a defense of values than of uh, classic, classically defined interests. Uh, <coughs> here I show you a little bit uh, the issues uh, with respect to uh, 
legitimacy. Um, as I said, we have a, a huge uh, body of common norms nowadays. We have a common legal framework and norms that uh, is not uh, just uh, UN Charter and uh, Declaration of Human Rights uh, that you can consider the, to be an outflow from the Second World War, but uh, this has developed in the whole um, uh, body of instruments uh, where uh, most of the actual uh, uh, nations have uh, contributed to and have accepted. Uh, so uh, uh, this is to underline my previous point that in fact uh, maybe we have not so much a problems of uh, 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 problems of cultural relativism. Uh, so we have to take uh, the cultural differences also into account in, in our work. We have also a whole uh, body of what you could call uh, common principles and values. Uh, uh, sustainability after the Brundtland Commission in 1987 has become a concept that is applied now in, in many different uh, situations. You have uh, other developments, uh, the, for example the Millennium Declaration, the Millennium Development Goals that um, uh, uh, stress the importance of uh, human rights, uh, of uh, human security. So, in the concrete uh, wording of his goals, afterwards, uh, development uh, issues were much more in the forefront. Uh, now, the revision that has to be undertaken because these millennium development goals were not achieved as planned by 2015. I think the revision that has, is starting now of this Millennium Development Goals will even more take into consideration, consideration human rights uh, issues, uh, institution building, uh, governance issues, uh, and so on. One more general principle, uh, I would say, and we see that in our concrete uh, daily work, uh, generally you need some common political will to promote peace and uh, security. If this uh, basic openness to, to make some progress uh, in the specific situation is not there, it becomes extremely difficult and hard to, to make any progress. And, uh, uh, I think uh, there is also a challenge here for uh, uh, institutions like yours, <coughs> maybe to find new approaches how you can create this basic common will to improve on situations and uh, uh, to engage uh, for a better future. Uh, because, uh, as I say, if, if if you don't have this very often, you have you see that your concrete programs and uh, what you are doing uh, will will fail or will not uh, give uh, expected uh, results. Uh, I would like now to turn to what are our principles of the Swiss uh, human rights and peace policy. Uh, we are basing our uh, work uh, very much uh, so on our uh, <laughs> constitution, Article 54, uh, that shows, uh, in fact, what I have uh, here in Ocker, uh, it shall in particular assist in the alleviation of need and poverty in the world and promote respect for human rights and democracy, the peaceful coexistence of peoples. I think it's interesting to know now that uh, already in uh, 2000 and before, because it was drafted before, uh, uh, Switzerland made this link between alleviation of uh, alleviation of poverty and uh, of uh, promotion of human rights and democracy. 
Uh, and uh, nowadays, uh, I mentioned the World Development Report, but also others. Uh, it is an established uh, fact, an established uh, uh, comprehension of, of the world that this goes very much to get it together. Now, naturally, uh, this uh, is uh, based on, on some convictions. I think uh, we are very convinced, convinced that uh, true security, peace and stability can be uh, sustainably established only within the community of states and within societies respecting human rights and fundamental liberties. Um, and, uh, It is certainly uh, something that uh, we strongly believe in and that animate, animates uh, our action in this field. We also think that the rule of law, and this includes uh, an independent, fair and efficient judiciary, must be given absolute priority over any political arbitrariness. Uh, the rule of law situations, for example, that are highly corrupted or so, uh, is, is an essential uh, ingredient. And uh, uh, if you cannot reach these basic uh, 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 rights and implement them through an independent judiciary, you certainly are in, in a lot of trouble if you want to make uh, progress in peace promotion or in, uh, promotion of human rights. We also think that true development goes hand in hand with the building of institutions. That was uh, once more uh, pointed out uh, very much by this World Development Report 2011. Uh, you need functioning institutions. Uh, it's not. Uh, uh, and if you don't have such institutions, at least you must try to build them and retry to build them because uh, without such institutions in, the, in a large sense, not just state institutions, but also, for example, uh, uh, civil society organizations, um, you cannot really advance uh, uh, in uh, conflict mitigation or in uh, development. And therefore we think that uh, an inclusive and participatory policies uh, must uh, be follow followed and actually when we engage in uh, peace promotion projects uh, or in human rights issues uh, and so on, we always uh, try to involve very much also civil society and uh, here I point out the importance not only of uh, 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 non-governmental organizations but also of the human rights defenders uh, in this uh, respect. Now, how do we address uh, or how do we implement this policy? Uh, we have, uh, I'm coming from the human, human Security Division of the Department of Home Affairs. We have roughly uh, speaking about 100 persons working in bilateral and multilateral peace promotion, dealing with the past issues, human rights policy, international migration, human, humanitarian policy. And uh, we have, in fact, many more engaged through a pool of experts that we are uh, taking care of within this uh, division and that are working in the field. Maybe some of you here in the public have already done such uh, jobs in our pool of uh, experts. I would be astonished, and uh, many others might follow and uh, engage on such uh, jobs in the future. We have an ordinary budget of 65 million a year. Uh, this is granted within a framework uh, credit uh, over four years, so it's 260 million over four 
years. It is uh, Swiss francs, actually. Uh, it is quite an important amount of money, and uh, we can do quite a lot uh, with this uh, indeed. We have also a special grant of 50 million over four years for a program that we are doing in the Middle East and the North African region. And this special program, again, uh, it is peace promotion, human rights promotion, and so on, uh, activities, uh, was established uh, in the aftermath of the so called Arab Spring, already in, on 11th March 2011. So we were, in fact, quite uh, quick to react, and uh, uh, the impl implementation of the different projects is uh, ongoing and has. Uh, taking well off. Uh, by that, uh, with this setup, uh, that uh, actually the Human Security Division is uh, 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 directed by uh, Claude Wild, a uh, colleague of mine, and uh, since also uh, two years now, and uh, by this it is far the most important policy division much more than any other uh, foreign policy division uh, as such. Naturally, we have also um, uh, development cooperation and humanitarian aid, uh, where uh, the engaged means are much more important. And within the uh, proclaimed whole of government approach, it becomes more and more important we have also to see that much of the uh, resources engaged through the development cooperation and humanitarian aid are in fact uh, going into uh, conflict mitigation, and, uh, uh, peace promotion and uh, human rights promotion. Uh, there are some uh, questions uh, after, from time to time why uh, we have these two different fields doing partly at, uh, at least the same, but uh, our development cooperation and humanitarian aid has some strict rules that are established by the parliament. For example, they help only the most, the poorest nations. And uh, we, in our peace promotion and human rights sector, uh, address and engage naturally with many countries that will not fulfill the criteria of uh, development cooperation. Now I would give you uh, a few examples of uh, what uh, we do uh, concretely before uh, opening then uh, I'm sure a very interesting Discussion. We have, sorry, I was, was I to, no, it's okay. Here. Human rights dialogues and consultations. This is one uh, thing that we do in, in my field. Actually, I do most of these uh, dialogues and consultations. We, have, we do this with the aim to contribute to the improvement of the human rights situation in an uh, individual country. We have some guiding principles. We do that only on the basis of a de declared political will of the partner country to engage in such an exchange. We do the dialogue on different levels. Uh, that means we have not just uh, diplomatic discussions between governmental delegations, uh, which take place normally once a year, but we engage very much uh, discussions with the help of uh, experts, uh, might be constitutional right, uh, might be uh, uh, penal uh, right experts, uh, penal procedure uh, experts, women's uh, uh, rights experts, uh, experts against uh, domestic violence, and so, or in the field of domestic uh, violence and so on. Uh, and we do that uh, also always combined with concrete uh, cooperation projects uh, in the field of human rights. And uh, in this we uh, 
try to involve very much uh, non-governmental organizations and the civil society also. Uh, naturally, when we do third, uh, such uh, dialogues and consultations, uh, uh, we do it on the rights-based approach. It's not so much that we have any uh, moral attitude, but we just take our mutual, uh, let's say, our uh, uh, engagements of, uh, of, the, of the two states that are uh, existing in this field and um, uh, uh, have a very uh, cooperative uh, approach to, to further the implementation and uh, better the implementation of the human rights uh, situation. But I can tell you uh, that in fact we can get also critical uh, remarks uh, concerning Swiss human rights policy. Uh, <laughs> we are not without problems. Actually, uh, uh, also Switzerland has uh, still problems in this field. No country can be exempted from that. And uh, so it becomes very often very interesting in these uh, uh, exchanges. Uh, the contents, uh, we take uh, a common decision generally on the basis of the universal periodic review. You probably know what this is. This is a regular exercise of the Human Rights Council uh, that has to be uh, undergone by every state where uh, the other states make uh, remarks and recommendations with respect to the human rights uh, situation in the other country. And actually, one first cycle within four weeks was now completed. All countries of the world have undergone this exercise of a universal periodic review. And uh, in the case of Switch, the second cycle has uh, started now. It will naturally very much look into the matter, seeing to which extent uh, those uh, recommendations and the pledges of the uh, uh, state under review have been implemented and where they stand uh, uh, with this uh, implementation. Uh, and uh, so we are looking forward now to a second cycle that started uh, a few weeks ago with Bahrain, and uh, in which also uh, Switzerland now is uh, coming up uh, in uh, October. Uh, if you would like to have more, some more explanations on universal periodic review, I'm ready to give it afterwards uh, if you wish so. Naturally, uh, uh, we also take into account uh, the reports of uh, our embassies uh, uh, to decide on these things and of uh, non-governmental uh, organizations like Amnesty or Human Rights Watch and so on to decide on which uh, themes we will address specifically and priorities that we will uh, include within these human rights dialogues and computation, or computation. Uh, there was sometimes a, a distinction between dialogues and consultations, but in our experience it doesn't hold, and actually we use now the both terms uh, very much to the liking of our partner state in this field, either of dialogues or of consultations. It doesn't really change the approach and the content of these uh, talks and the connected activities. Uh, an important point here that is noted at the end of the page, of the page and that, that you have already seen, uh, we need or, or we try to coordinate uh, this bilateral approach uh, also with a multilateral uh, approach uh, and very much so because uh, Generally, within uh, one country, not always, but in, in some countries, we are the only one to do something like that, but the only country to do something like that. But very often, we have multilateral organizations like uh, the Human uh, 
Beispiel die, äh, äh, der Human Rights Council, so die High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, die UN, uh, UNDP uh, and so on. And uh, we tried to uh, kind of coordinate uh, these uh, approaches also with other bilateral or multilateral actors to uh, be coherent and uh, if, uh, obtain more efficiency uh, in this approach. Another example of activities is uh, dealing with the past. This is uh, uh, interesting uh, scheme that uh, was developed, in fact, and is copyrighted by our department of Swiss Peace, a uh, non-governmental organization. It shows uh, different things. Uh, first of all, I think it shows the complexity of uh, issues that have to be addressed when you come from a conflict situation, you want uh, to go through conflict transformation uh, towards uh, reconciliation and uh, in, in fact uh, non-repetition that are the, the main themes of any activities uh, in, in, in this. Uh, to, to do that uh, you need, uh, as I pointed out already beforehand, uh, in another context, uh, very much a state of, uh, that respects the rule of law. And uh, uh, the other important issue that must be respected is that there is no impunity. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, the, this is a scheme that helps also to define all our operations. Uh, uh, it, it shows that uh, the focal groups to which address your activity in uh, peace uh, promotion are the victims uh, on the one hand and the perpetrators. Uh, and it's very important that I think you address both this uh, 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 focal groups or, or you focus on both these groups because if you neglect one or the other you will probably not reach uh, uh, satisfactory uh, results. This showing also that uh, in, in modern uh, peace uh, promotion work you try to have a very holistic approach that uh, addresses uh, many different things. <coughs> And uh, within the circle you can uh, see uh, a few things that uh, need to be addressed, uh, like the right to know. Uh, in fact, uh, this is done through truth commission, investigation panels, but it has also the dimension of uh, missing persons. You should know what has happened with persons that uh, went missing during the conflict. We should, we should also pay attention uh, in this respect and actually um, uh, this is uh, <coughs> quite some lengthy work generally in, involved to establish the archives of the conflict, uh, uh, to change history books. History books very often are a major ingredient in conflict because they uh, give uh, uh, mythical approach to some facts of uh, in the life of a nation uh, that uh, can uh, be used and are used uh, to uh, uh, struggle or to, to, uh, to neuter conflicts among different groups uh, within the country. Also naturally you have to take into account uh, the, right, the right to reparation uh, those who have suffered from the uh, conflict, the victims must uh, get uh, some reparation and uh, if uh, you this, uh, or neglect uh, these issues, you are uh, much in danger to uh, go in the, into the next uh, cycle of the conflict. 
then uh, the right to justice, uh, uh, very important that there uh, is uh, uh, justice institutions established that uh, will uh, be able also to uh, address uh, conflicts that arise after the main conflict has been subdued. Uh, because conflicts uh, naturally continue, we have always come, but we must have mechanisms to address uh, and, uh, such uh, uh, different interests uh, in a rightful way. And uh, you have to do a few things uh, that are mentioned here, also I'm not sure whether you can uh, uh, read that, but uh, uh, that gives uh, some guarantee of non-recurrence. Uh, very important points there, the, uh, as I pointed out, the institutional reform, actually in the immediate aftermath of a conflict, uh, the uh, disarmament and demobilization. You can see that, for example, now in Libya uh, and uh, in other uh, conflict areas. Then we have also the democratic control of security of the security sector, that means of the military, of uh, 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 and the police forces. Um, we have, in fact, a, a specific established in institute uh, in Geneva, the DCAF, that is very much uh, invol involved in this kind of operation. And you also have to do some illustration and vetting. This is a difficult uh, uh, task, uh, but probably without that uh, it is not going. Uh, though, uh, why is it difficult? Uh, uh, let's take Rwanda. Rwanda was a conflict where hundreds of uh, thousands of people have become murderers. Now you cannot punish or uh, exclude hundred thousand of people from any uh, uh, job in the administration or anything like that. So you, you have to, you are faced with the very difficult question uh, whom you should uh, make responsible for such uh, mass acts and uh, this is a very difficult task uh, within the dealing with the past issues and actually, until to now, we have very different approaches. Uh, we have uh, approaches uh, of, uh, I would say, for example, now the International Criminal Court, where you pick out certain perpetrators and you uh, will judge them, but you will not go for uh, many of other perpetrators who were more or less dependent on, on, on those that you pick. Uh, out. And you have other approaches to say or criticize the International Criminal Court for that and say, uh, in fact, you should go after all the perpetrators. But as I said, in the case of Rwanda, this would be quite impossible. I mean, so you probably have to live uh, with some uh, compromises uh, in this field as well. What is important to, to see with this uh, scheme, uh, it can really be of operational help and uh, it can uh, show you what to do in a specific conflict uh, situation. And it takes into account all the different factors, that are the major factors uh, uh, that uh, are uh, going into a conflict situation that need to be addressed. Finally, I would uh, address a few more classical uh, uh, instruments uh, in his uh, uh, work that is facilitation and mediation. We make this distinction. Facilitation, actually, first of all, it is a fact that uh, since the Cold War, that means uh, in the last uh, 20 or even 30 years, uh, almost, or all, almost all, maybe there are an exception, one or two, but uh, I think almost all armed conflict 
have uh, been resolved through negotiation and mediation by third parties. That means that the conflicting parties are generally not uh, able to come out of their vice cycle of uh, violence, but need the intervention of uh, third party actors. Uh, classically, Switzerland uh, has uh, always done some work in this field of facilitation and mediation, but uh, it has uh, very much developed. Uh, you probably uh, remember that uh, we always had uh, these good offices uh, to offer, for example, Geneva as a place for meetings between uh, uh, the leaders of Russia and uh, the states during Cold War or uh, uh, to offer some place for peace negotiations like uh, 1954 for Vietnam or, or uh, many others. We have this tradition, but I think with the difference to the past, uh, nowadays you have um, to choose approaches uh, that are much more going into the detail of the conflict enough. Uh, it, it, it can still be helpful to offer a room uh, and a place where to negotiate, but very often conflicts uh, nowadays are so complicated that you need a very well formed uh, people that can uh, do uh, useful work uh, in, in, in such uh, situations. And actually that your academy is just doing that, I think. That's what we are trying to do, to uh, form uh, people that really understand all the different factors that go into a conflict and can help to come out of this conflict. Uh, as I said, we distinguish between facilitation, that is more just uh, to help parties of a conflict in a conflict to come together and uh, 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 then to help them to address the issues themselves and to improve uh, the situation without much intervention. In the case of mediation, we are much more uh, uh, also giving them uh, or offering them naturally at their request uh, 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 ways or methods how to address the uh, conflict and uh, how to find uh, solutions. <coughs> but once uh, more, let me stress that uh, uh, these negotiations today are uh, generally, usually, highly complex, and uh, very often it is not one single mediator who will intervene, but it is a kind of team. Uh, that uh, draws expertise from different uh, fields like uh, constitutional law, uh, election procedures, uh, security system reform, uh, building states, new state structures, uh, disarmament, uh, decoding, de uh, mining or other things in this uh, field. Uh, it, it needs a, a really bunch of, uh, of approaches uh, that uh, can, uh, uh, in the best case, bring peace uh, to a conflict-ridden uh, country or a conflict-ridden region. I think a last uh, remark also that uh, Switzerland very often today is not the only one who intervenes in a conflict or uh, in such situations. You have interna international governmental organizations, you have uh, uh, states, you have uh, other uh, uh, non-governmental organizations. Uh, and all together work for this aim of building uh, peace. Uh, and uh, if Switzerland I think, can offer something that uh, is also very often highly appreciated, it is a 
kind of neutrality in our approach. It is a high reliability when we engage once we are uh, there for uh, as long as necessary and we will not just withdraw because something is happening uh, or the, the government or one federal council is changing. I mean, we have a high reliability and we have certainly also a high credibility uh, insofar we, as we don't have really uh, political agendas uh, 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 traditionally in, in our uh, uh, policies, foreign policies. We are just not uh, uh, a major power in the world and this, in this sense can help uh, uh, for this kind of work. Last, uh, I would uh, uh, address uh, an issue. Actually, just to give you a full, true example where we have some successes in uh, interventions uh, with facilitation and mediation, for example, in Sudan or Colombia, Sri Lanka, uh, Uganda, Nepal. If you are interested, I can give you some more details on this. And the final word, uh, from time to time, people think that there is a conflict between uh, peace building and human rights. Uh, we are strongly convinced of the contrary, because uh, if you really want to build peace uh, durably, um, uh, you must uh, take into account human rights, and, uh, you must uh, insist that human rights must be uh, respected. Uh, uh, we had, uh, it, it, from time to time, this ca can come across, <coughs> you can come across these issues uh, in, in the way of a difficult uh, dilemma because uh, people will tell you, yeah, for the moment, uh, let's go for reconciliation. We, we don't want to discuss much human rights with you now. And, uh, we just uh, try to, to, to be peaceful with one another again. And uh, we maybe later on we address human rights issues. But generally, generally this is not working. And we have uh, uh, had a study into this matter because uh, it was a pattern that showed up uh, from time to time. We, and we study of the uh, international think tank came clearly forward uh, with uh, the uh, proposals that uh, you must take uh, human rights uh, very serious in conflict resolution and uh, there might be from time to time a little bit maneuvering and so on but uh, finally uh, uh, lasting peace, durable peace uh, can be established on the taking into account uh, human rights uh, issues. Okay, with this I would conclude and uh, I would thank you very much for your interest.